Hello, everyone. My name is Thomas Smith. I'm a member of the Net Capital Business Development Team. Let's allow a few moments here for everyone to get settled in. All right, this is great. Good. Folks are still coming in. All righty. Well, welcome again. And today is our net capital. June Demo Day, and we are thrilled to have five very exciting companies with us today. I have the pleasure of speaking with members of Acquire Exchange, High School Responder, AIEDC, DO Biosciences, and First Root. As always, each of these companies are actively raising capital on the Net Capital platform. So after the demo, I encourage everyone who is with us live and those who will be listening to this recording in the future to visit netcapital.com to view each of these exciting offerings. A few housekeeping items before we get started today, just regarding the format. To start, we will allow five minutes for each pitch, followed by a few minutes of Q&A. For the Q&A, please use the Q&A functionality when interacting and not the chat. After all five pitches, each company will have two minutes in closing remarks on why you should consider investing in their business. And to kick off tonight's demo, I have the absolute pleasure of welcoming, welcoming Luke from First Root. Luke, come on in and tell everyone the great work that you and your team are doing. Thanks a lot, Thomas. I'm really happy to be here and I'm happy to be with all the other fellow entrepreneurs. We are a, a crazy bunch and we need each other. So welcome to the other entrepreneurs. Our focus is on solving financial literacy. Let's talk a little bit about some of the problems. We know that there is a rather massive wealth gap in our country, and we know that COVID has made this wealth gap work. The challenge, though, is that this not, is not just an American problem. If you look at the social science research from around the world, we find that the more unequal the society, the worst it performs on every dimension of health and social problems. And this impacts wealthy people as much as poor people. If you look at what happens in the United States, the wealthy are just as affected by these social impact problems as less uh, advantaged people. Now, there's another factor in this. This is about two thirds of the problem. And so we might say, well, how come we're not making better progress on this? And that's because we have lost faith in our democratic institutions. Around the world, we see democracy plummeting. The future outcome of these two trends is not something that I wanna see happen. So we're gonna fix it. How do we fix it? We teach kids how to manage money by giving them money to manage. The solution consists of three distinct things. The first is participatory budgeting which is a process endorsed by the United Nations in which you give children money and you support them in planning, ideation, how to spend that money, refining those ideas, voting, and then implementing them. We have a standards aligned curriculum that supports teachers and we wrap it up into a scalable, easy to use app that runs on any device that kid is gonna use. Now the experience is pretty straightforward. Here's a young man who's walking to school and he's like, hey, I wish our lived environment, our infrastructure was better. We need a covered walkway. Using this process and using First Root, that student can make that proposal and see it come to reality. And the kids do amazing things. One of our customers at Purdue University, they were given 2,500 by the principal. They chose a mini library and a new pergola. At an elementary school in Madison, Wisconsin, we gave the kids $1,500 and they invested in things like a new tree for the playground and soccer nets. In Fremont High School, they were buying outdoor seatings. So we see kids do a lot of money with infrastructure and make amazing choices when given the opportunity. Now, our business model is designed to be easy to start and easy to scale. For a classroom or a club in the school, it's a buck a student, 
when you start to do it throughout the school, it's $10 a student, which has additional capabilities, things like single sign on and reporting and other infrastructure that schools need. And then finally, we moved into when there's a district or a network of schools, there's a managed budget. Now you might wonder, well, why should I do this? And why should I invest in first route? Because I am an expert in participatory budgeting. My last company was Contenio. I founded it in 2010 to create participatory budgeting solutions for global enterprises. My customers in my last company ended up managing more than $3 billion in portfolio management using our platform. As you can see, those companies were name brands that you know, eBay, Daimler, b &W, Salesforce, Cisco. All of these global teams were collaborating on our platform. I successfully sold that company in 2019 to Scaled Agile, completed my integration tasks, and now I'm back at it using the same techniques and the same technology and the same kind of infrastructure attacking a problem in schools. Thank you very much. And I look forward to listening to all the great ideas from the other entrepreneurs. Thanks so much, Luke, and really appreciate the uh, very concise and, and straightforward uh, 30,000 foot view of first route. A um, couple of questions came in from that. And I think the first one that, uh, that I think is worth asking is, where did you come up with this novel idea? I know you, you, you explained it a little bit, but like from the core and the impetus of it, where did you first think of it? Yeah, my background includes working in large companies, both as an individual contributor and in being an executive. And I just remember when I was a VP at some of these large companies that I worked in, how awful the annual budgeting process was, right? We were supposed to collaborate. And then at the end of the year in the annual budget, we ended up fighting and I hated it. So I wanted to create a process that was more inclusive of people's opinions and also a process that reached out into the organization so that we could get the employees feedback. That manifested itself through participatory budgeting as a portfolio management process. And it's now, uh, I'm proud to say at Scaled Agile, that's the world's largest development method for software development. More agile teams around the world use the Scaled Agile framework than any other method. And participatory budgeting is an integral part of that process. So when you look at my work in cities, if you look at my work in uh, large companies, it was just natural to experiment with schools. And as a father of four kids, when I saw the lack of financial education in schools, I didn't grow up with any financial education. So I had to learn how to make good financial choices on my own. I don't want our kids to have to go through that every step of the way on their own. Thanks, Luke. Um, next question is, can you talk about the team a little bit, you know, really who's supporting this and the folks that you have on board helping you drive this? Sure. So the core team is myself. Uh, Clint Gossett is my head of product. He is a Visa and a Verifone veteran. So he brings in the payment and fintech experience. Donovan Colquitt is my head of strategic partnerships. He's got a PhD in engineering education. So he brings in the education component. We're supported by some of the most amazing advisors on the planet. Uh, many entrepreneurs have heard the name Alexander Osterwalder associated with a concept called the business model canvas. So Alexander is a dear friend of mine. Many entrepreneurs use his work and he's my first investor. Another very famous uh, one of our investors is Vern Harnish. Vern Harnish is known for Gazelles and Scaling Up, which is an organization that helps high growth companies succeed. Uh, Vern says it pretty well. He was an investor in Contenio and he said, I made a ton of money in Contenio. I wanna make a ton of money in First Route. So we've got some amazing investors backing us with some amazing advisors and some amazing uh, experienced operators. Luke, fantastic stuff. It's been, it's been great to see and you know, watch the progress and learn more about First Route as you've been on, on Net Capital. And we're just really you know, looking forward to seeing what First Route can do in 2021 and then many years beyond. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right. Um, well, next, I would like to introduce Jim from Acquire Exchange. Jim, welcome and great to see you again. Hey, thanks, Tom. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to uh, share a little bit about Acquire Exchange. Um, by the way, Luke, I'm going to invest. Thank you. <laughs> Great presentation. 
So I, I want to share a little bit with uh, both our current and potential investors, uh, just a, a, a snapshot of what Acquire Exchange is all about. The Acquire Exchange is a comprehensive platform that allows the issuance, tracking, exchanging, and redemption of loyalty rewards across multiple programs and businesses. We're initially bringing our offering to the mobile and video gaming industry to help both esports and game publishers increase retention and grow revenue through personalized offers and common loyalty rewards. We're introducing our platform in three distinct phases. So phase one was launched uh, late last year and it allows for the exchange of in-game issued rewards and subsequent redemption of those rewards for cash. And throughout the remainder of 2021, we'll be releasing our uh, personalized or targeted rewards offer engine and multiple redemption options, which help drive value for both our uh, game publisher partners and their gamers. So a good way to think of this is imagine investing in a publicly traded company, but without access to public exchanges, such as the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. Or think about how you would go online and shop for both new and used goods if you didn't have online marketplaces, Amazon, eBay, and the like. Or imagine the challenges of foreign travel and commerce if you didn't have foreign currency exchanges. This is the same challenge that exists today for both valued customers and the businesses that are issuing their own uh, digital rewards to acquire and retain those customers. Game publishers, retailers, travel and leisure companies, all of us have got you know, frequent flyer miles, I'm sure, and financial services firms significantly benefit from rewards programs that both retain loyal customers and keep them coming back. Now, unfortunately, most rewards programs are siloed and do not bring a common shared value to the customers that these companies want to attract. This creates a diminishing value of issued rewards to targeted customers of those firms. I think most of us on this call could, today can think of the many points that they have sitting that they're never gonna use in a particular rewards program. Well, the, the impact of this is also adversely uh, negative for the, the companies themselves because their financial performance goes down. So to increase the value of those rewards programs to both businesses and their customer, Acquire Exchange brings a common financial technology platform for issuing, tracking, exchanging, and redeeming those rewards across multiple programs. To give you a perspective of this opportunity, today there are over $300 billion in reward value that are locked within these millions of siloed programs and businesses across those four markets. Within the mobile and video gaming market, which is where we're currently delivering our offering, over $37 billion in earned reward value is available for the 2.7 billion gamers worldwide. So we are an experienced team of entrepreneurs who individually have launched and grown successful companies with very attractive exits. We spent the last several years together developing the architecture, platform, intellectual property partnerships and real-time interfaces needed to successfully bring our offering to market. We've invested over $8 million to develop, pilot, refine, and prepare this offering. We've had agreements with MasterCard, game publishers, retailers, reward program market leaders, and key strategic partners. And these partnerships have us well positioned for our market launch and expansion. As I mentioned earlier, our version one was launched in fourth quarter of last year, and we're now onboarding game publishers and their games onto our platform. To date, we've signed 10 letters of intent with game publishers and developers. We're also in discussions with two of the top 10 publishers in the gaming market. This year, we'll expand our functionality for personalized offers and multiple redemption options that these top publishers both need and want. We're currently working with, the, with these top publishers uh, to develop a, a, um, a, a solution set that they can use now and well into the future. We're working with our strategic outsource development partner, KiwiTech, as well as with Amazon Web Services to have a scalable and upgraded deployment of this functionality to increase our, our market potential. 
Included in this next phase of our launch is a proprietary infrastructure for sharing in-game events that will give us a competitive advantage in the market. So I look forward to your questions today and I turn it back to you, Tom. Jim, thank you so much. And before we get started, we just received a question from Pamela. And um, for sure. all everyone who's listening uh, right now and those listening in the future, uh, but for those listening right now, I just put the website and where all these companies are hosted right now, which they're actively raising capital, netcapital.com. And Pamela's question was, can I interact um, with the folks and panelists and um, and and the companies that I'm interested in investing in? And the answer is yes. You can go to netcapital.com. Each of these has a discussion page and you can interact with um, either these individuals or someone from their team, uh, team via that uh, discussion page. Jim, we have a few questions for you, and thank you very much for the great sure. and thorough and um, really thought out presentation. First one is someone has done a little research and uh, has the question on, um, you know, just really your background and how'd you get to this point and how'd you come up with such a novel idea? Well, so I've been, I've been in uh, this business for many years, you can tell by the gray hair, and um, you've been a serial entrepreneur. Uh, my first venture was actually a, a, a systems integration company where we were able to do very complex integration for Fortune 500 companies and uh, also for large government organizations. Uh, we grew that with an uh, initial $30,000 investment. Uh, I served as CEO and we grew that to a, a $40 million plus company and uh, ultimately sold that to a Fortune 500 company. Um, I've always had an interest in bringing technology to uh, business problems and solutions. And what really came to light was, was the problem, you know, that small retailers, small game publishers always had is how do I attract those gamers and, and, or, or shoppers and retain them over the longer period of time? There are many rewards programs out there. It's easy to implement a rewards program. Problem is from, a, from a, a, a customer point of view, those rewards have limited value. They're good to get you back maybe for a couple of times, but maybe you know, that, that, that next free pizza doesn't work or that you know, next hundred gold coin in the, in the game doesn't work. So, so what our platform is all about is bringing the, that, that common infrastructure where those rewards can now be shared from a, from a, from a customer or a gamer point of view they now have the ability to uh, get a common reward that really has value. And for the, the, the business, it creates that additional value. And so they want to stay with the game or the retailer longer. Got it, Jim. Thank you for the, for the holistic response. I know there was a couple of questions there, but thank you very much. Yeah. Um, next question is, you threw out some big numbers there and acquire exchange. There's clearly the market opportunity is massive. Can you touch upon that a little bit? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's a, as everybody knows, the gaming marketplace is exploding, it's double digit growth. And so, you know, you could say, well, okay, so it's a huge market. I mean, there's $180 billion in, in annual revenue in the gaming market. There's, you know, one in, I think it's the statistics say three of every four people are a gamer in the US. Now, that includes free to play games, it includes, you know, the heavy duty games like League of Legends. But uh, the reality is that, you know, for our solution set, to, to be successful in our four-year business plan, we need to penetrate that one-tenth of 1% 1 of that market size. So it's, it's really a very manageable opportunity. That's what gets, gets me excited. I mean, we, we're uh, over four years, we're projecting to, to acquire, uh, meet all of our projections with 100 game publishers out of, out of over 10,000. Jim, this is exciting times for Acquire Exchange. And, uh, and thank you for, like I said, the thorough and in-depth presentation, answering those questions. And uh, as with all of our panelists, Jim will be back in a few minutes uh, when we wrap up to give uh, the few minute wrap up of Acquire Exchange. So Jim, thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Next, it is my absolute pleasure to in introduce John from DO Biosciences. John, why don't you come on in here and tell the folks what you and your team from DO Biosciences are doing to revolutionize your space. Great, thank you. First, a test in one, two, three to make sure everything is uh, still working. Am I there? Great, fantastic. All right, let's share my screen here. Great, 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 all right. Thank you, Thomas. Um, yeah, everybody, I, I, we have the um, the full uh, 
pitch deck on our offering page, uh, as, as probably uh, many others do. So I'm going to uh, just uh, breeze through to try to keep this uh, somewhere near five minutes and uh, uh, avoid uh, digging into anyone else's time uh, unnecessarily. So if you're a, uh, I can tell you, if you're a uh, disciple of Guy Kawasaki and his 10 slides rule, uh, you're not going to be a fan necessarily with me tonight, but you know we're going to try to. Uh, we're not necessarily going to give it in depth on each one. We're primarily going to go for uh, uh, for uh, the big overarching picture. So uh, you know, let's just get going here. Uh, I think we're very fortunate to have a story that's I think intuitively obvious to everyone. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time really setting up because I think we all understand that uh, cancer is a problem. Uh, it's still an unresolved medical problem, uh, despite some of the breakthroughs of the last uh, decade or so. And, uh, it, you know, it, it's obviously a major problem for humans, uh, not just in the United States, but uh, globally, of course, uh, both uh, industrialized and, and emerging um, economies, as well as, of course, uh, uh, lesser industrialized uh, nations. But uh, many people don't realize that it's also a major problem for uh, our pets, uh, our animals. Uh, there is a very high incidence of uh, certain types of cancers uh, among canines, uh, much, much higher than humans. Uh, and uh, there's also a fairly high incidence of cancer among felines, uh, our cats as well. Uh, overall, uh, the rate of cancer incidence is about the same in humans and in dogs, but there are certain areas where dogs are particularly susceptible to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, cancer. So, um, you know, we have two uh, problem areas there in terms of uh, potential uh, uh, patient populations. And we um, are submitting that we have a potential uh, candidate that's certainly in the preclinical development stage, but uh, has shown some very promising data to date. Uh, we refer to it as DBX31, and it's a naturally occurring uh, biomolecule that uh, attacks a wide range of cancers through a um, phenomenon called uh, apoptosis, uh, also known uh, as cell suicide uh, to uh, biology majors out there. And if it uh, maintains its um, uh, uh, predicted um, uh, attributes through uh, uh, clinical testing, uh, it should uh, be uh, safer, um, more cost effective, uh, in terms of commercial synthesis and uh, have broader applications than many current uh, treatments. Uh, the focus of uh, uh, DO bios, excuse me, DBX31 is uh, not just any uh, stage of cancer, even though uh, it's demonstrated uh, efficacy across all stages of cancer, but uh, in particular, there are particular therapeutic importance is that uh, it operates through a phenomenon called extrinsic apoptosis. And, uh, you know, without going into uh, the wonkish talk, basically, um, it's, a for, it's, a, it's a met that's a way that cells, we're all familiar with the concept of, of cells, uh, living things are all made of, uh, all made of cells. Uh, cells can die generally through necrosis or apoptosis. Apoptosis is a far and away preferable means of cells uh, dying. Necrosis is a bad way, it's a very bad uh, uh, method uh, and has a lot of uh, negative, uh, nasty side effects. So if you can achieve cell death, you want to do it through apoptosis. But even within apoptosis, there are two types, um, extrinsic and intrinsic apoptosis. Now, DBS31 operates through extrinsic apoptosis. Uh, that, is a prefer that is the uh, widely regarded as the holy grail of cancer treatment because while early stage cancer cells can die through intrinsic apoptosis, they lose the ability to die through intrinsic apoptosis at advanced stages. Um, therefore, really extrinsic apoptosis is the only real option for killing cells at that stage, but it's not, it hasn't been an, an easily achievable um, outcome uh, to date, one that's uh, uh, readily available and achievable by a therapeutic uh, on, on uh, demand. And our um, very um, uh, Encouraging uh, result is that DBX31 induces extrinsic apoptosis. So let's just go through quickly. We um, covered this in our video online. We subjected a wide range of, of um, treatment resistant advanced stage metastatic cancer cell lines to uh, testing against DBX31. 
and you know just to cut through the chase without going through the details of which what uh, they all consist of. Again, that's available online. They covered a wide range of cell types. Uh, the results were that apoptosis, extrinsic apoptosis in particular, was induced in all the cancer cell lines, and the death rate uh, ranged from 42 to uh, nearly 99 uh, percent dead after uh, only um, 72 to 96 hours, and it occurred in a dose-dependent fashion. The importance of um, that is that uh, the relationship between death uh, and cell death was uh, a linear relationship. Uh, thus uh, affirming the um, causation to uh, DBX31. So um, even where there were lower levels of cell death, that was due to less, um, less exposure to DBX31. The other great aspect of it was that no adverse effects occurred in normal cells. Uh, that's just the micrograph of metastatic breast cancer, which is one of the cell types that we, um, uh, that we succeed against. Uh, one showcase aspect of the research is that we were able to um, achieve very positive results against uh, a cancer cell line that, just to put in just plain talk without going into uh, the technical details, is basically an invent essentially an invincible cell line uh, where uh, cancer uh, therapeutics are concerned. It's called sk 3 And um, it's a ovarian cancer cell line. It's a negative control uh, uh, meaning that it's uh, widely used because of its confirmed lack of P53. That is a gene that's necessary to induce intrinsic apoptosis. So if it dies through apoptosis, it cannot occur through intrinsic apoptosis. Well, the result was, and the particular, well, before getting to the result, the particularly uh, impressive aspect is that it's so treatment resistant to cytotoxins that it was even invincible to a... Um, cytotoxin combo of uh, DTX and ricin, which is basically uh, a bioweapon. So it's, it's not even merely resistant to actual cancer drugs, uh, such as chemotherapies uh, depicted in this uh, display here from UCLA Medical Center, but it's actually resistant to cell death uh, by a, an actual bioweapon, an outright uh, cytotoxin. Uh, something that would never be used for actual therapeutic purposes. But even then, what you can see from the um, uh, display here is that SKOV3 had negatives across the board in this row where the arrow is, meaning that it was non-responsive to every compound that it was exposed to, consistent of both drugs and, again, a bioweapon. So how did it respond to DBX31? Well, we killed it uh, quite extensively, uh, uh, over 80% cells were dead within 72 hours. And so in this particular uh, set of experiments, it, we outperformed two of the top selling chemotherapies and technically a bioweapon. But again, we only killed cancer cells. So while there's the suggestion of extraordinary promise mm -hmm. and potential to DBS31, we need to de-risk and prove this with greater statistical certainty. So we're going to pursue the next phase a test, a translational model that has been proven to provide over 90% certainty uh, as a predictor of results in future human clinical trials. It's called PDX, patient-derived xenografts. That's an innovative platform technology that accelerates the development of oncology drugs by predicting their clinical efficacy. And that is the um, really the gold standard that exists today for screening uh, promising candidates, particularly uh, cytotoxins. Uh, immunotherapy is not so good for that, but the type of drug that we're dealing with, perfect. And um, keep me honest here, uh, Thomas, uh, uh, do we have about another minute or so, would you say? You got about 30 seconds, John. We're running a little over, but if 30. you could just wrap up. Okay, okay, okay. Well, I'll just, just basically uh, cut the chase here. The um, results of the next phase will give us uh, the data we need to not only predict possible efficacy, but also accelerate the development time frame for both the preclinical development of the human pathway, drug pathway, but also application as a veterinary drug. So while the normal time frame is X number of years for a standard oncology drug, um, because of accelerated uh, development options with FDA and with the, in the veterinary drug space, 
we would very realistically look at reducing, taking years off of that. So that's, uh, that's basically it. And uh, we're taking any questions. John, thank you so much. And, um, you know, I, I know we've worked uh, together and you've worked with a couple of my colleagues or whatnot, but I've never actually got the in-depth uh, description from, from the horse's mouth from you about deal biosciences. And, um, you know, my mother actually just, uh, she just beat breast cancer. So when I was uh, talked to Eric and he was saying, you know, uh, you know, do, would you like to host? And I, I was excited because anyone who's trying to do anything with cancer, I'm a fan of. Um, but enough about me. Um, we did run a few minutes over, but we can hear the passion in your voice. So I'm going to loop two questions into one. Can you talk about the impetus on why you founded the company? And then secondly, um, just allude to and touch upon a little bit on the team. Okay, sure. Um, I, in terms of the impetus for the company, I think the, the best news I can say is that this wasn't spawned from the mind of any single individual, uh, either, my, either my mind or uh, any of our researchers. It was uh, obtained, the lead uh, for this um, compound was obtained through bioprospecting. And so it's a uh, clinical, it's an observation, a, a clinical observation that we're reverse engineering versus an idea in our minds that we're forward engineering. And I'm humble enough, and um, I, I think I've seen enough uh, examples in the real world to know that um, it, it's, 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 it's just not prevalent or common that uh, there are that anyone's that smart that they can just independently, um, spontaneously at will, uh, think of uh, a breakthrough uh, in cancer research. It, it, it involves, like many uh, great uh, breakthroughs, a bit of luck combined with opportunity and uh, appreciation. So that's why I say it's number one. It, it's it's not it's not uh, necessarily out of it, it was not out of the mind of any single uh, person, rather observation in nature that we uh, came across. Uh, two, in terms of the team, we're, um, we're, we're currently composed of uh, researchers with university backgrounds, uh, primarily off Cornell University, but the development path in front of us will require a multidisciplinary development approach, and we're going to use uh, expertise and technology from different sources. So we're going to contract, uh, for example, with PDX, um, uh, models. They come out a very special uh, company that uh, specializes in that. And uh, so it, it's there's there's talent on board right now with that background, but there's also talent uh, to come that we're going to utilize on contract basis. John, thank you very much. And um, you know you're you're a very humble guy and humble responses. But thank you for the uh, for the thorough response and the great presentation. Next, I would like to introduce Barbara from High School Responder. Barbara, why don't you come on in here? I know you have a few folks with you from your team, so I'm going to let you introduce everyone. But um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Barbara from High School Responder. How are you, Barbara? I'm well, thank you, Thomas. Thank you for having me. Um, Great. And Barbara, five. before we get started real quick, John, could you just unshare? Um, on, on oh, I'm chat? sorry. Sorry about that. My apologies. No, no worries. <laughs> No worries, okay. Barbara, take it away. Okay, all right. So um, my name is Barb Grimm and I founded High School Responder after working in the high school setting for many years. I brought with me uh, my CFO and CTO, uh, David Cooper, and also our chairman of the board um, is here, Ed Baldry, and I'm gonna have him lead the charge on this and then you can come back and ask any of us any questions, but we're going to team tackle here today. <laughs> That's perfect. Uh, how's the uh, audio? Is that, can everybody hear me okay? Works fine. It's great. Terrific. Terrific. Well, uh, first and foremost, thank you, everybody. It's an honor to be here, and uh, it's a tough act to follow behind Luke, Jim, and John, but we're going to do the very best we can. Uh, we welcome everybody. As Barbara said, my name is Ed Baldry. I'm an early investor and chairman of the board for High School Responder, and I'm honored to speak on behalf of our team. Uh, the uh, founders, Barbara and David, who are also with us. So first and foremost, what is High School Responder? It's a rapid response, fully secured mobile app. It's designed to act as a messaging system for today's high schoolers in their vernacular, on their terms, utilizing technology they're comfortable with. 
The goal is to empower these students to discuss their concerns before they get to the crisis stage. The business is cost effective, it's easy to implement, and it's massively scalable. So what we've done is we've put together a number of slides for you to look at um, some of the, the app and some of the software that supports that. Thank you, Barbara, look at you, way ahead of me. Uh, the very first screen here is the student app. And there are basically four primary functions. Pretty straightforward, log in, I think we all know what that is. A check-in, which allows a student to speak about themselves and their current frame of mind. A tips screen or function to inform people of potential crisis or situations for others. Uh, and this function can be done in confidence. And lastly, an acknowledgement screen to let them know they've been heard and somebody's been notified. The next uh, screens would be the staff app. So imagine on the other side of the spectrum, you have the students on one end and then the administrative staff of the school on the other. Um, this also has four primary functions. The landing, the landing page, which will have notification flares. Secondarily, they'll have an incident list to help them stay informed and keeping track of those issues assigned to them. There's an incident details page where the staff member can chat, make notes about the incident, um, and also close it out. There's a menu which allows them options for quick navigation uh, around you know, the different functions to report on said incident. Uh, next slide, please. It's important to note that the app is available on most smartphones and also school issued equipment such as Chromebooks or tablets. The implementation, once again, is a very light lift and we would utilize the campus's respective Wi-Fi's. Next slide, please. This screen shows a static view of what we call the escalation matrix. This is the administrative software that the school will use to manage their notification protocol. Who receives what, who's on deck for which days, who's part of each student's communications ecosystem. This software will ping the assigned staff until the task is addressed. Um, the system can also generate customized reports for compliance needs, which is a, becoming a bigger and bigger issue, an important issue for schools, especially around budgeting. Uh, next slide. This slide shows a snapshot of what we call the grants and sponsorships or our own internal nickname, Gracepo. Um, this software is designed as a speed dating tool to help match up schools and grants slash sponsors or foundations. This software will help match up schools with monies out there to assist them to pay for high school responder services. In a perfect world, this can help deliver these services at little or no cost to the schools. High School Responder has a dedicated expert team of grant writers that are there to assist the schools with the process. So once the school comes aboard and they are in dialogue with us, we can help them go out and find the monies to pay for the software and support. Slide. Uh, the business model, it's worth mentioning. Uh, is a SAS seat licensed business model. In the US alone, there are 29,000 public and private high schools with approximately 23 million student, high school students. So adding the UK and Europe and the rest of the world, that number goes up significantly. So the addressable market is huge. And I think it's very fair to say that everybody's aware of the, of the current crisis that mental health issues are bringing to schools. Even in a pre-COVID environment, uh, we saw massive numbers of kids that were suffering from either bullying, depression, anxiety. And then we all see the horrifying news stories when there's um, lethal violence. But at an order of magnitude, the, pre the, the, um, the presence of bullying, depression, anxiety, is there. So if we can bring a system to bear for these uh, students that will allow them to engage in dialogue and communication, they can hopefully uh, 
break down this, the chain before these, these episodes reach crisis stage. So uh, with that, uh, we want to thank you very much for letting us tell you a little bit about High School Responder. There's a ton of information on the Net Capital page, uh, and we've really enjoyed working with that team. I'd like to turn it over to uh, Barbara and uh, David for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Ed. A um, couple of questions for you guys, and Ed, thank you for the thorough and, and great overview of High School Responder. And I just think, you know, like you said before, covid um, there was obviously the mental health crisis and, and things were, um, you know, just getting getting a bit out of control, not only, you know, in the U.S. and, and across the world. And and now, you you know, I think there's a, there's a fear with parents. I know my friends who are parents that, um, you know, there uh, there there could be serious um, a, a serious pitfall from obviously being at home for for 15 months. So I think that parlays into the first question, which is, um when you think about high school first responder between this date and through the end of the year, and also the first half of next year, two part question. Um, what's most exciting for the remaining uh, half of the year in 2021? And what are you most excited about going into 2022 for the first half of the year in terms of development and getting high school responder to where you see it being? I think Barbara's our, our person for that one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. From what I'm hearing from my um, fellow school workers from, from what they're, looking at is it was a tough year and so there are a lot of them are really glad to have gotten through it um, in some areas of, of the United States um, the uh, situation is better than others with regard to the vaccinations but even um, the students that you normally wouldn't suspect that are having problems did and it is getting worse and so what I'd really like to do is we've got some you know, a great app. It's simple to use. It's for someone who's in crisis. It's something for the kids that they can use. It's not um, something um, that they'll find hard to use and they want to help their, their friends. So looking into, into the future, uh, the more uh, students' hands we can get this into, the better um, the staff will be able to help those students. It's an efficiency tool as well. It is something that goes on every school day where they're looking to help a student and it's gonna be worse in the fall, sadly. And so this way, you know, staff members can get to those students if it's an emergency need right away. And if we need to, to find them and locate them, we are, you know, we're able to do that if need be. And uh, as far as the technology, I'm gonna have David um, quickly touch on what else he's gonna be pulling into the app um, for the remainder of the year. We pretty much have the MVP done, locked, loaded up on the stores. Our second version of the MVP is coming out where it allows us to use beacons for a more precise location. When a child calls out, we're like 911. We know where they are. So the question, fire, police, or medical becomes teacher, guidance counselor, or family and friend. And so our response is in, in that place. As we grow, I think the biggest technology challenge for us in the future is making it multi-language and having the idiosyncrasies of each different area be able to come through. So we're making this so that everybody can use it. That's our big push. Yeah, definitely. Th thank you, David. And just to parlay off that, I got actually three inquiries about the 911 approach. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about, you know, kind of the basis of, you know, the, the general thesis in high school um, responder and, and kind of the communication between one another. And if there's any ties in or plans to, uh, was the exact quote, any ties in or plans to with 911 in the future? Well, actually 911 works a lot differently than we do in terms of we're a decentralized situation mm -hmm. that works in each different school's environment. So uh, in Pennsylvania, for example, the, it's much more centralized the 911. And they're an emergency care or you know, response organization. We work there for wellness, which is an everyday job. It's not only when there's a random event that could cause catastrophic damage. It's the catastrophic damage that occurs every day. 16 million kids were bullied last year. You know, 11 million kids thought about suicide. So we're dealing with those situations that come on. 
there's a lot of other folks that are trying to deal with response uh, that we we take a softer approach. We're much more catch it before it happens, not respond to it as it does. So that's our that's our mantra. But you know, one other thing I would add to that, if you don't mind, is that also um, all built into the app is the ability to ask for police, fire, or ambulance. Yeah. Yeah. That's in there. We 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 hope that button is the least. We hope that is the least used button of all of them. Right? We'd like them to communicate and talk the problems through before they get to police, fire, ambulance. Yeah. So, it's so all good though. So I think that's such an important um, distinction. So just to be clear, this is more, you know, kind of of the proactive approach where you're day to day and trying to handle the situations as opposed to the reactive where it gets to that point where, Ed, to your point, you can dial 911, but, um, you know, hopefully through the day to day communication, it doesn't get to that point. Just want to clarify because there were a couple 911 questions. Um, yeah, and if I, if I can speak to that, basically in the school setting, you know, a, a child will show up, you know, either for their own selves or for someone else. Yeah. And so then it's a matter of, you know, do we, who do we have available? Is it the school psych? Is it the guidance counselor? You know, do we need to get the nurse? You know, what is the situation? And then sometimes depending if they're dealing with another situation, the way um, we have the escalation matrix is if that first person is not available, it'll cascade, if you will, after a certain amount of time, the school determines to the next person. And then if that person, God forbid, wouldn't be available, then we can do a blast out to even more people. But we have the ability um, to send it out to different people should there not be a response that would be immediately. Or if we do need them immediately, like Ed said, you know, hey, is this an emergency situation? We can get the staff to that kiddo right away and we can figure out if we do need to call other resources outside of the school. I think it's worth mentioning that Barbara was a former 911 dispatch professional. Yes. So that, yeah. that's part of her DNA uh, with, with the education, so. Awesome. Well, we can tell from the team and uh, also seeing this go through Net Capital and, and from the beginning stages of working with you guys um, that it's a well thought out product and congratulations on the success thus far. Thank you. Before I introduce Leonard, I just want to remind everyone for Leonard's company that's coming up as well as the four that's presented, you can visit netcapital.com to invest in any of these businesses. They're now live raising capital um, and just being unbiased, taking my Net Capital hat off. Um, I recommend that you just take a look at these companies and visit their pages. Um, I am not giving investment advice, but I recommend that you take a look at these companies and, and visit their pages. Leonard, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you last, but certainly not least. And I can tell you that not one person has dropped off from this demo day. So I think it's a testament to the four presentations, but everyone is excited to, to hear you and what you and the folks at AIE DC are doing in the industry you're in. Leonard, welcome. Yeah, um, I actually, and Thomas, I know we're just meeting. I go by LS, so just LS is simpler. Um, LS, you, you got it. You can hear me good. Um, I just want to commend, first of all, regardless, I just believe in life. Let's commend John and Barbara for what they're doing and everyone else, because um, we're building a greater community. And so I've been with Net Capital for a while. I'm very familiar with it. Um, people could just go to Net Capital and you can look at the company's names and you know find them or Google. You can Google Net Capital AIEDC. It's, it stands for Artificial Intelligence Economic Development Corporation. And what I'm looking to do, and, and full disclosure, I'm greater than 42. And I think a lot of the panelists have, have had that senior experience. Um, but the road to Stanford was not an easy road. Um, I, and so Barbara, I, I'm still stuck there mentally, so I need to move on and be focused for my own shareholders and, and business people because I do that. But I've been blessed to be given a mind somehow and intelligence that everyone says, I, I don't even put myself as being on that level. I just happen to know a lot of smart people and some would put me in that category, but um, we need to change the world and do it. So let me get to the point of what AIDC is. We're using AI for economic development. And what I mean by that is one of the first products is a 5G mobile app maker. 
which will allow small and mid-sized businesses to create their mobile app on iOS or Android with no code or low code. Behind that, we will run artificial intelligence, okay? Um, and then eventually we will run artificial general intelligence. And then what's coming later is quantum artificial intelligence or quantum machine learning. Now, these are gonna be high technical terms, but let me simplify them. Um, uh, did my postgrad work at Stanford um, when I was in my, my, my late hood, 2016 is when I finished it, getting a PhD in AI. Um, my professor was um, an academic director who's now retired, was the premier decision probability uh, person at Stanford for 30 years from MIT. Um, I should have gone technically from Stanford to Sand Hill. What that means is the venture capital role. And it wasn't such a great role because a lot of VCs wanted more equity. And so I decided to crowdfund. Um, when you're talking, I'm, I'm reversing order and I'm not doing a deck because it's simple. It's just helping small and mid-sized businesses in the beginning to create their own, their own mobile app and, and just to bring it home. Starbucks saw 80%, well, some, some say 80%, but I would say 40 to 60% increase in revenue since they had a mobile app. This was before COVID, just so people could prepay the purchases, you know, do FinTech or tech and just um, uh, automize that. Um, so when you talk about um, automation and everything, small businesses don't have that team to create an app themselves. They say, okay, I'll use Facebook or a third intermediary and, and go to websites, et cetera. But if you can, and people would say, well, I just rather go to websites. Well, we're in an app world. And so if you, that's why Apple is being sued by other apps, but the app store is significant. The app store is about 60 to 70% of Apple's revenue or their profit. So apps are the key. And so when you can make an app and you can directly communicate as a small business owner, because I come from humble means, as a small business owner to communicate directly to your customers without them going to a third party, i.e. your website, which takes some time to do it, and or Facebook or LinkedIn or anything else, um, they're going to communicate more with you. And if you can take purchases and orders and so forth, but then be able to add on the back end of that, um, artificial intelligence and economic development where we're going to provide services uh, to allow them to like a subscription model of what the economic headwinds are coming. So um, people say COVID wasn't predicted, but some AI companies predicted it in Canada back in October of 2019. Um, they said exactly where it would spread, how it would spread. Um, and, and just to give a highlight, um, my team members consist of uh, the former, my chairman is the former director of NASA um, uh, and the Canadian Space Agency, which built the International Space Station. My other board member is the head of AWS Global Machine Learning Technical Lead. And AWS, for everyone that doesn't know, is Amazon Web Services, which is where Jeff Bezos, 90% of his, his wealth is, is concentrated. Um, and he was the former, he was the co-founder of the Global Partnership Network for AWS. My other board member, an advisory board member, is an AGI scientist at AGI Laboratory and the head of Boston Consulting Group. So I've been fortunate to have the team to be able to execute and we're doing it. It's how do you give back and how do you change the world? Because everyone looks at Facebook and Amazon and LinkedIn and they'll say, wow, I wish I could have invested when, when, when Apple was Apple. But now looking at Apple's trillion dollar valuation, they're just just you know, riding the bandwagon. And I think I ultimately, personally, I think it's God's plan that I'm here. I'm a believer of that. It, it's interesting that I wanted to crowdfund because I wanted to make it aware or available to the people to get shares early before you hear about it later. Um, but that being said, what we will do is be able to provide this service at a reasonable cost for small and mid-sized businesses, which by the way is about investors place did us a recommendation for us recently um, about uh, AI, you know, small businesses is the global economy, or at least the U.S. It's about 70% of the U.S. economy. And in Europe and other countries, it, it really aggregates where the base of that economy is. And these are small and mid-sized businesses, not just retail. It doesn't have to be e-commerce. It could be services. It could be insurance services. Or it could be a CPA, whatever, professional services. When you enable that to your customers, you're able to, in part of the COVID pandemic, 
has not allowed these businesses with shutdowns to be able to communicate to their customers directly and then take transactions because you can do all this. We're all, we all learned about Zoom later. Like, oh yeah, we can actually communicate later, you know, once Zoom is here. But I was already in this world and just trying to change it and being humble about it. But um, because we can't, you know, just I don't want to be too philosophy. I always do that. And it's good that maybe Eric's not here because. I'll get into that world. And I um, and just for disclosure, I've been in the Bitcoin space since 2010. No cryptocurrency. I don't own any of it, but been in the technology, written three books on it. And when I wrote my latest book, 26, 2017, which is in Amazon and everywhere, Bitcoin was $800 and I predicted it would go up. I said, this, this technology will never go away. So when I think about Jack um, um, Dorsey and, 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 and all of these other people getting on and Elon Musk, it's intriguing to me, but we all kind of knew this would occur. And it's just where the future is going. And it's a matter of technology, innovation, uh, I think crowdfunding and, 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 and the crowd and being um, distributed is going to change the world versus, you know, who decides who will be successful, who not. If you're building something great, continue to build. So my hat's off to all the other panelists, continue to build. It, you're, it's never over. And we just keep continue to go forward. And for any questions, you can just, you know, this, you know, there's a QA with me and Eric for about an hour about my company. There's an offering page that explains everything on net capital. So all of that information is there and that's it. Well, LS, you are extremely humbled. And uh, you know, when I was speaking to Eric before we got on tonight, he said this is one of the best guys I've ever worked with. So it's an absolute pleasure to meet you. And I know, you know, you've done some things with Eric and, and the webinar and whatnot, but what are you most excited about in 2021 for your company? How we can help people. It's a mission. Like, you know, um, I, you know, it, it humbles me because when my chairman says you're a genius, I said, I'm not. And, and I've studied this. I, I get it, you know, and people are talking about Egypt, what they don't know, what they do know. There, it's not the fear that's coming. It's how do we use technology as humanity to help humanity? Why do we need to do you know, this, this war back and forth? And it's just my belief. And so there's Paul Romer's work who won the Nobel Prize in 2018 for economics. The world's changing and we don't need to respond or react to when it changes. It's like what Barbara was saying about the school thing. You don't need to wait for the bullies to bully you to have some solution before that. You, know? um, you could have a a response system in place if we just implement it. So to me, what I'm most excited about, I think, I think, I think the majority of the masses are catching up, they're being educated, and they're realizing where to put their dollars or their discretionary investment income and invest in companies way before Wall Street get it. And I think GameStop and AMC has taught that like it doesn't need to be controlled by these people who conglomerately say, I'm going to put a trillion dollars behind this company and keep it going. Um, you could do it now because what most people don't know is that Amazon was, was, you know, no profits for like 25 years and now they're AWS and they're looking really well, but that's fine. But at the end of the day, we can back local and global companies. So I'm excited about, you know, AIDC specifically, we're expanding. We've got a lot of partnerships in place to, to scale up to about a hundred thousand customers through our partnerships. Once we finish this round, we may do another one with an MVP, but I'm excited about the world changing and waking up um, and, and being access to that knowledge, which has actually been sort of in a very small circle. And everyone who knows me, and I know quite a few people, they're like, LS, you always talk too much. I'm like, I'm going to get the knowledge out there. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care anymore. I'm not going to hold, we're not going to hoard the knowledge because too many people are suffering and that's it. Ellis, you've you've earned that right to to distribute the knowledge and and thank you. I think all of us on on this call and and this demo day have enjoyed it. And before we get into the the closing remarks, we're gonna uh, one to two minutes for each company just to wrap up and why you should be looking at them for investment for their company. I just want to thank everyone. Um, unbelievable. And I, and people think I joke, but I think they can see it and and my passion and what I, I love about this job. I have the best job in the world. I get to talk to these brilliant entrepreneurs every day, all day. It's awesome. So thank you to all five of our panelists and companies before we get going on the closing remarks. And as always, netcapital.com, you can visit it right now to invest in any one of these companies. And again, 
I'm unbiased, but I think everyone should take a look at each of these companies because these people are doing amazing and brilliant things in the space that they are in. LS, we, I know you were the fifth to go and we're going to kick off with you one to two minutes about AIEDC. What's most exciting and why folks should consider investing in your company? Well, we have several patents um, and service marks and trademarks. Um, and so that didn't come up, but yeah, um, we actually own, so when you talk about artificial intelligence and everyone knows this artificial intelligence is the future, um, we actually own MIND, which is Machine Intelligence Neural Network Database. That's what it spells out. So um, if, I, if I were to tell you AI as a service, AI as a service is projected to be a $5.5 trillion industry. Um, there's another company on Net Capital, Genesis AI, full disclosure. We have a partnership with them to provide the, the back end tech. So AI as a service is growing to a $5 trillion industry um, projected in the next three to four years. Um, we own those patents. I mean, AIDC and myself um, and it's machine intelligence neural network database, which spells out the acronym MI, literally M.I.N.D. And you may see that in the future powered by MI, like AI as a service powered by MI. That's the next frontier versus software as a service, which everyone knows. Um, because it depends if you have the, you can execute. So when you get to that, we own that and a couple of other um, trademarks uh, for algorithms to do that process. Um, that's been, we've owned that since 2017. So uh, it's why now, um, it's the same question. I've said this in, in some of the Q and A, you know, if you could invest in Apple prior, would you? Everyone always goes backwards and says, yeah, of course I would have, but they're looking at the present going back. So I, I no promises, no guarantees, but the future will definitely include artificial intelligence, machine learning, artificial general intelligence, and at some point quantum, whether it's in all fields horizontally. Um, that doesn't mean, you know, like cyber ransom and ransomware, everything, we will go toward that world whether we believe it or not, accept it or not. And it's coming, it's approaching fast. And only certain companies, I think, with footholds of defensible patents and service marks, trademarks, et cetera, and team members can execute on that if they're not, you know, bought out. And most likely, I have to think about it. I'm greater than 42. So uh, I do have board members on AWS, but I don't know if Jeff walked over and said, hey, I want to buy you. I'm like, I don't know if I want to sell. So, but, but at the end of the day, it's whatever's in the best interest of the company and the shareholders, but early bird catches the woman. That's all I can say. Ellis, thank you very much. Barbara from High School Responder, why should folks consider investing in you and the team's company? Well, I'm going to say, first of all, I'm going to give the majority of it to David and, and Ed, but basically we need to save the kids. We need to take care of them. They are our future and we need to do it now. And um, I'm going to have David take it from there, but that's, that's the goal. That's the so goal. your direct question to a CFO is how do you, why should you invest? And I'll tell you, here's how I got to the place that I'm at and see if you can appreciate it. I was trained classically as an accountant to go after the profits and the revenues. Unfortunately, during that same period, I caught an addiction to technology. And so my goal was use technology to make sense, C-E-N-T-S, sense. And that was fine for years and years, and I, I did it very successfully. Barb came along and addicted me to a different thing that has since turned into our mission, Leonard. It's our mission. And what we're doing now is making S-E-N, S-E, sense, okay? And this is all about communications. And what we know is no problem gets solved without starting with communications. Mm -hmm. We're a communications company. That's what our job is. I'll quickly use my favorite analogy. We're like Paul Revere's horse. Paul Revere rode across the countryside and yelled, the British are coming, the British are coming. It was the responsibility of each of those villages to respond the way they wanted to. It was Paul's job to yell, the British are coming. And it was the horse's job to get the message through. 
that's what we do. And we're going to do well, both physically, sense, and sense. So, Ed, close it up, buddy. <laughs> oh, you're muted, Ed. And you're I, think we, I think we've got it. <laughs> well, again, just in closing, I agree. I identify with the mission. Um, the, and the, the group of people that are here with High School Responder have purity of heart. Uh, the early betas are very promising. We need more school. We need more kids pressing buttons. And then we can help more people. So I'm going to follow LS and say the goal is to help people. And that's not just the youth, it's the families, it's the communities. So there is an opportunity here and it's, and it, it's not, um, it's not breaking rocks in the hot sun, right? I mean, we can do this if we get together, if we have the right kind of funding and if we have the right sort of passion behind the project. So thank you very much for your time and your consideration. And Thomas, everyone. And Thomas, this is LS. Um, maybe can you have Lily like email all the ones that are panelists so we have their contact information uh, if that's permissible, because we can collaborate, and I love what everyone's doing. I don't see conflict at all. That'd be I mean, awesome. Full disclosure: I actually have a partnership with Genesis AI, who's on the platform. <laughs> Would love that. More collaboration, so we can change this world instead of just being in a silo of each other's own self-interest. That's all I'm saying. Absolutely. And I mean, everyone who's here knows that Net Capital at the core and at the thesis, we are about community, right? Bringing people together. So I can assure you that by noontime tomorrow, everyone will be connected and uh, you will have each other's information and we promote collaboration, right? Um, that's the thesis at, at Net Capital is we want to get many people involved as possible, whether not only be from the capital standpoint, but from the companies that are our clients and that we work with and that uh, we have the privilege of representing like everyone on this platform. Um, John, Dio Biosciences, you are up and one to two minutes on why folks should, should consider investing in your company. Yeah, okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, you know, I, 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 that's a personal decision, obviously, uh, but I can tell you why I would consider, why I have invested in the company and why uh, I, I would invest in a company right now again. Um, I think there are two main drivers for investing in just about anything, and maybe may particularly for this, which is uh, one is a humanitarian driver, and two, I'd say, is uh, an investment um, potential return on investment type of a driver. And you have to make, you know, obviously that last uh, determination on your own, figure out what, you know, make your own deductions and calculations about that. But I can say that, um, you know, when you look at the concept of risk versus reward, uh, this is probably, there's a natural trade-off thing we all understand there. Uh, you know, the greater the risk, theoretically, the, you know, the greater uh, the reward potential. And I, I think that right now is probably the riskiest time of our uh, company, uh, of our uh, uh, timeline. And I, I say that because, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we're going to uh, pursue a um, translational test at the next phase that will uh, uh, go to great lengths to de-risk uh, and remove a lot of the question marks we're in the potential for our uh, molecule. We're not going to go for the easy hurdle. We're not going to go for the low hurdle. We're going for the high hurdles just like we did before, and we're putting this through its paces. And so uh, the greatest question marks regarding what the potential and what the status of our candidate is uh, or will be exists right now at this moment. It won't exist for better or for worse after our next set of studies and tests. And it's gonna eliminate that, uh, that question mark with, it, with a high degree of scientific precision. So if you understand risk versus reward, and, and frankly, whether or not there'll even be a, an opportunity to invest uh, after that uh, for anyone, just due to a, a number of uh, you know, related uh, uh, reasons and factors. Uh, now is the best time if you wanna get in uh, for uh, either the uh, investment a potential reason or the humanitarian reason. Uh, now is the best time to do that. And I'd say just to kind of close out the humanitarian side, you know, you don't want to uh, uh, allocate your money strictly uh, out of uh, emotional sympathetic reasons, of course. You have to be more uh, sh uh, discriminating than that. But uh, simultaneously, I think you have to ask yourself a bigger question about, you know, what's your life purpose and where are you going to 
put some of your resources? Is everything going to be regarding strictly pursuing ROI, or can investments have a, a dual purpose? And I think you're looking for that. If uh, you relate to the fact that uh, cancer is a problem for everyone, I think everyone can do that. Uh, this, uh, I think, this uh, company and this uh, opportunity provides a lot of uh, a lot of reasons for you. John, thank you so much, Jim from Acquire Exchange. Why should folks consider investing in Acquire Exchange and your company? Thanks, Tom. Well, first of all, I would just say that I'm, I'm honored to be here with this uh, group of uh, outstanding professionals and, and entrepreneurs. It's, it's really humbling to be here. Um, the reason to invest in us is similar to, to a lot of these companies. You know, we're built on the foundation of a strong team. Mike Flanagan, our CTO, Bill Wilson, our CMO, have all had prior successes uh, they're, uh, they're seasoned entrepreneurs. Uh, they know how to conduct business and how to execute business. And, and that's really the core of any business is can you execute? And, and, and the answer is clearly yes. But behind that team are a set of investors that are already adding value, not just in funds, but in terms of uh, their intellectual property and, and support. And, you know, I can't go without saying that, you know, we wouldn't be here today without that, that strong level of support. You know, just like LS said, you know, it's, it's all about uh, building to the future and, you know, and then giving back. And, and certainly as you invest in any company, the, the net of that is that you get the opportunity to, to invest in the future for our kids. Uh, and I see that in spades. So we're, we're a great, um, you know, opportunity. We're at the front end of a very large market uh, in the gaming community. We are taking a platform that's already developed and is well tested in a, in a space that understands us, which is retail. Uh, we tested that with MasterCard, uh, did some, some major pilots. And so we're ready to launch in this environment and have some, some great successes. The final thing I'll say is that I love crowdfunding. I, I was always skeptical and now I'm, I'm, a, a, I'm an advocate because I grew up, you know, uh, my dad was a railroad section foreman. I grew up in South Dakota, like, all, like LS was saying, we all have modest roots. I was very blessed to, to be where I'm at today. And uh, it is, it does open up the opportunity for all of us to invest. And I just think that's great. So thank you. Jim, thank you so much. And uh, it's been a pleasure, you know, working with you as with everyone uh, on this demo day and just really excited to see where your company and everyone else's uh, company is going. And before we wrap up, Luke from First Root. Luke, want to give you a minute to two to let people folks know why they should consider investing in you and your company. Whoop. Luke, you're muted. You're right, I am muted. Um, thank you, everyone, and, and thank you for the fellow entrepreneurs. You know, we've been talking about invest, and every one of us has answered the question, invest. And the question that I would like to challenge you with is, when we give money to kids, what do they invest in? And I gave you some examples, but I want to close with the following example. One of our pilot schools was the Academy of American Studies in Queens, New York. This is a Title I school in a low-income part of the city. And keep in mind that this is the school. The kids are making the choices. The kids create the ideas. The kids chose more menstrual products for the girls' bathroom. And I brought this to my family at dinner. And I said, what do we all think about it? And of course, my wife, who's been with me through my last company and a lot of, a lot of work, I'm a serial entrepreneur and everyone knows what that means. She says, oh, honey, you men, you're just so clueless. I know all these education people want to put in new chemistry equipment and new gymnasium and bring in computer science and biology. But if you're a young woman, and you are menstruating and you do not have the right feminine care products, you are just gonna call in sick because you don't feel comfortable going to school. And Barbara's nodding and all the men are going, wow, I never thought of that because we're not that lived experience. And so when you look at what kids purchase, when you look at what kids invest in, in their schools, it'll, it'll blow you away. 
And so I'm going to give everyone a graphic because I think all of the entrepreneurs in this particular call, Thomas, I think it was this one thing that was unique to all of us is I'm going to share a picture that I'm going to challenge all the people on the phone call to consider. And we've been talking about investments and you can classify every investment in your life on two dimensions. What kind of financial impact are you seeking? What kind of social impact are you seeking? Well, if all you care about is your financial return, that's fine, right? That, that's, that's up here, right? In this dimension. And if you don't care about your financial impact, then you're just kind of after as much money as you can. Now, if you don't care really about a financial return, well, then you can make a gift and, and a donation to a, uh, a, a nonprofit. And that's, that's fine. That's down here. It appears that what myself and the fellow entrepreneurs are presenting to all of the people on the call and all the people watching is, do you want to make an investment in this quadrant? Do you want to consciously choose to support organizations that are designed to have both high impact and high returns? And we can you know, debate about the degree of return and the degree, the degree of impact, and that's okay. I mean, that's, that's not what we're here to talk about. What we are here to talk about is what do these kids do right here? Right? What do these kids do when we let them make that choice? We find that they create high impact investments. Thank you. Luke, thank you very much. And that concludes our June demo day tonight. And I had a blast and I hope everyone else had as much fun as I did. It was just such a pleasure talking to each and every one of you. Some I've worked with A through Z uh, through the Net Capital platform. Some I've gotten to know through colleagues and some um, my colleague Eric Cox has worked with uh, directly A through Z. And just on behalf of Net Capital, thank you for choosing our platform to democratize the fundraising process and provide the opportunity to invest in each of your companies to anyone. As I've said before, and I will say again for the last time, each one of these companies is raising live right now on netcapital.com. And as I've said before, I encourage everyone to uh, take a look at, at the thesis of what these companies are doing, because we've talked about impact, we've talked about change, we've talked about disruption, we've talked about market opportunity. There's so much going on here that I encourage everyone to, at the very least, visit these offering page. And if you're inclined, if you'd like to invest, the invest button is in the top right. And um, we, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. On behalf of everyone at Net Capital, thank you and most thank especially you, Thomas. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, everyone. It's been lovely. Thank you. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Thank you, guys. Bye -bye. Ciao. Bye -bye.